Squaring the circle is an unsolved classical problem in geometry. The task here is to construct a square equal in area to a given circle. And in the tradition of good old ancient Greek geometry, this has to be done using compass and straight edge alone. Starting from the ancients, countless mathematicians have tried their hand at tackling this problem. No one had managed to solve it exactly. After countless failures, Experts began to suspect that the problem was, in fact, an impossible one. This indeed turned out to be the case. The issue was that the problem demanded a geometric construction of square root of pi. Now in 1837, Pierre Wanzel showed that the lengths that could be constructed with compass and straight edge alone had to be solutions of certain polynomial equations with rational coefficients. When Van Lindemann managed to show in 1892 that pi was in fact transcendental, that it could not be solution of any polynomial equation with rational coefficients, it was finally established that it is impossible to square the circle keeping within the restrictions imposed by classical geometry. At least, you cannot do this in a finite number of steps. Thus, the problem is not just an unsolved one, but an unsolvable one. Now, we do not exactly know why the ancient Greeks wanted to square the circle, though given their penchant for symmetry, it may not be too hard to guess the reason. On a different note, they may have obtained false hope of reaching a solution from the fact that Hippocrates of Chios, not to be confused with the physician, had found that it is pretty easy to square a particular circular lune, the region bounded by the two purple arcs shown here. The area of this lune can be easily shown to be equal to the triangle, from which it is trivial to construct a square with this area. Another famous lune that can be exactly squared is the lune of El Hazan, named after the Latinized version of the name of its 10th century inventor, Hassan ibn al Haytham. In fact, it was not until the mid 20th century that two Russian mathematicians, Nikolai Chebotaryov and Anatoly, Dorodnov completely classified all lunes that are constructible by compass and straight edge alone, which are equal in area to a given square. It turns out that there are only a small number of them. The fact that an exact squaring of the circle is impossible did not deter mathematicians from trying to find approximate constructions that came very close to the exact solution. The construction that is playing out on your screens right now is one that was discovered by Kochansky in 1685. By the end of the construction, we will get a line joining the points marked P3 and P9. And the length of the line segment joining these two points is very, very close to pi times the radius of the initial circle, which we can take to be unit. It then takes a small number of extra steps, well known from high school geometry, to construct the side of length square root of pi, and hence construct the square that we need. Now how good was Kochansky's construction? The length of P3, P9 can be worked out from elementary geometry. To be square root, of 40 by 3 minus twice square root of 3, and that turns out to be equal to 3.1415333338, a result which differs from the exact value of pi only in the fifth decimal place. Apart from this one, there are many more constructions of varying complexity and accuracy, many of them by some of the greatest names in mathematics. India's own Srinivasa Ramanujan gave a few, one of which managed to attain 8 decimal figure accuracy in his estimate for pi. And talking about estimates of pi, we definitely must remember that two centuries before Kochansky, the mathematician and astronomer Madhava of Sangama Grama, the founder of the Kerala School of Astronomy and Mathematics, had given an infinite series that could determine the value of pi to any desired precision 
by summing up more and more terms. This series was later rediscovered by Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz and is today called the Madhav Leibniz Gregory series. And it should be something which is familiar to all high school students. Some of my ex students had collaborated to make a beautiful video on Madhava's methods, and I will give a link to that in the description below. Let us now go back by two millennia to ancient India. We find references to both squaring the circle and its converse problem constructing a circle equal in area to a given square in the Sulba Sutras, which are ancient geometry texts that describe the construction according to strict geometrical principles of various ritual altars. Though the reasons for the Greek interest in this particular problem may have been primarily aesthetic, Sulbakaras, the authors of the Sulba Sutras, had a much more practical reason for taking interest in these constructions. According to Vedic tradition, all households were supposed to have at least three holy fires or agnis, altars that served specific ritual purposes. On the west, we have the Garhapatya Agni. This one was lighted first and was the center of all rituals. In most traditions, this was circular in shape. To the south was the Dakshina Agni, semicircular in shape. Finally, to the east we have Ahavaniya Agni. This one was square in shape. It was demanded by Vedic tradition that these altars have the same area. This gave the Sulbakaras an immediate reason for trying to square the circle or circle the square. Now, in the Bodhayana Sulba Sutras, which date somewhere between 800 years before the Christian era and 500 years before the Christian era, we find a prescription for finding the site small a of a square whose area matches that of a circle of diameter d. And the sloka that describes this particular prescription goes as follows. Mandalam chaturashram chikirshan vishkambham ashto bhagan kritva bhagam ekona trinkshadva vivajya ashta vinkshadi bhagan uddharet bhagasacha shashtam ashtam bhagunam Now, as I have explained in my last lecture on the Sulba Sutras, the Vishkambha of a circle is its extent or diameter. Here, you are being asked to divide the diameter into eight parts and then take one of the eight parts and divide it up further in a 29th part and then the rest in six and so on. And the mathematical expression, which this sloka translates to is on your screen right now. If you just simplify things a bit, this reduces to an expression which looks like this. Now, since our square has an area a square and the area of the circle is pi r square or pi d square by 4, we are demanding that these two things should be equal or at least approximately equal. To see how good an approximation this is, what we need to do is use the formula above and see which estimate of pi this leads to. A bit of calculation shows that what this formula tells you is that pi is approximately 3.088326, a number which does not match the value of pi that we all know from school days, but it is smaller than the exact value by only about 1.6%, which is no mean feat given how long ago this result was actually written down. The Bodhayana Sulba Sutra also gives us a geometric construction for drawing a circle which has the same area as a given square. And the sloka for that goes along the following lines. Chaturashram mandalam chikirshan akshanayardham madhyat prachim abhapatayet yadda dati shishyate 
तस्त सह तृतीय न मंडलम पड़ी लिखे वॉट दिस ट्रांसलेट टू इज द फॉलोइंग Start with the given square, which I've labeled A, B, C, D in the diagram. From the center, go to the west end, that's the A, and draw a circle with that radius. Daksha or line parallel to the sides through A cuts this circle and the square at two points, which I have labeled M and N respectively. M and N is a segment which is the excess. And sahatritiyena means take one third of that excess along with the side, and then mandalam prilikhet draw a circle. So this gives us an approximate construction for a circle whose area is claimed to be equal to the area of the given square. Now let us see whether that is actually correct. Now in the diagram, I have labeled the points. And it is easy to see that if twice a is the side of my square, then O a is just square root of two times a, and that means that M n, the excess, is actually square root of two times a, the radius of the circle, minus a, to two minus one times a. So distance from n to p is one third of this, so root two minus one by three times a. Thus. The radius of a circle, OP, turns out to be a plus root two minus one by three into a. That is root two plus two by three times a. So we have R equals root two plus two by three times a. Now our claim is the area pi r square of the circle equals the area of the square, at least approximately, and the area of the square is twice a whole square. That is four a squared, and this tells us. That this particular construction estimates pi with 36 by root 2 plus 2 whole square, which works out to be 3.088311. This result does not exactly match the one we had before, and of course does not exactly match pi, but it is quite remarkable that the two estimates of pi that are given here, though arrived at quite differently, turn out to be very close to each other. They actually match up to three places of decimal. And as I said before, being shot by 1.6 percent more than 2,000 years ago is no mean feat whatsoever. However, if we go back about a thousand years to ancient Egypt, we can find an estimate for pi which is even better than this one. The Rhind mathematical papyrus, dating from around 1550 BCE. Is one of the few remaining mathematical works from that era. One of the problems it deals with involves the determination of the volume of a cylindrically shaped granary. Certainly, an even more practical concern than that of the construction of altars. The prescription given translates in modern notation to v equals one minus one ninth of d whole square times h, where v, of course, is the volume of the granary. D is its diameter, and H is the height. A little calculation, and we arrive at V equals 256 by 81 times R square H. Since high school geometry has taught us that V, the volume of a cylinder, is pi times R square H, this gives us an effective estimate for pi, 256 by 81. And that turns out to be equal to 3.1605. This overestimates the exact value by only 0.6 percent. Now, neither the Sulbakaras nor Ahmes, the scribe of the Rhine papyrus, has left us with any clues about the thought process behind their results. So all we can do is speculate. One possibility that I can think of. Is that their methods were primarily experimental? The Indian artisans may have first constructed a square altar, and then tried to reshape its bricks into a circular one. A possibility that I feel is strongly suggested by the design of the altar that you see on the screen right now. On the other hand, the ancient Egyptians may have worked out their estimate by determining the number of boxes that could be filled up by the grain in their cylindrical granary. As every physics student knows, 
Using an instrument with a smaller unit size allows you to measure stuff more precisely, which may explain why the Egyptian estimate for pi is closer to the exact value than the Indian one. Now, in this short video, we have traveled a long, long distance in space and time, from ancient Egypt to semi-modern India, as well as ancient India, ancient Greece, and so on. I hope you have liked the ride. Bye for now.